Well, they were here. Oh, there they are. How are we doing? Yeah, let's stand over here. So, so last week, um, our conversation was more heated. <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping that this time we can have a bit of a calmer conversation. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> Right, but I, I want to be clear why I want to have this conversation with you, right? Because if I've understood your beliefs correctly, and I'm open to correction, you don't believe in the Trinity, is that correct? Okay, which means from my perspective, you're not a Christian, you're not part of the church, and you're not saved. And it is important, therefore, to engage with you, right? Because I think you're capable of understanding the truth, and I think you're capable of embracing the truth, okay? So... Uh, and, and, I, and I'm going to assume good faith. I'm going to assume that if you see good evidence, you'll accept it. Like, all right. So to start off the conversation then, I, I just want to ask a simple question. When, uh, for you, did Christ begin to exist? Mm. You see, from my perspective, I don't have a... For me, the answer to that question is not important in the sense that... I, I would not put my, my colours to a mask and say, I 100% know. Right. I know there are prophecies concerning, essentially, the one that the father would hide like an arrow in a quiver. Yeah. yeah. And that he may be the firstborn of creation, he might be the firstborn of the new creation. Yeah. But in terms of the pre-existence piece, you can question me on it and I will, and I will just say, look, the, um, a profession of understanding of when Jesus came into being, yeah, yeah. I do not believe is a requirement for one's salvation. And, okay. then I'll, and, I'll, and I'll base that upon clearly the testimony of Peter, the testimony of the scribe, but moreover, the book of Revelation. Yeah. Yeah. And also the message to the churches and, and in none of, the, none of the books. So I know, and, and I would also then demonstrate ways why I do not believe Jesus is an eternal being. Yeah. Um, and again, just going largely to the prophecies, all the, all the messianic psalms, those of David, those of, um, yeah, basically, yeah. and I'll go to them. So we can start there, I'll be, and you can, you can hammer me if you like, which is fine, um, but you know, I'm not going to, so I have no problem with Jesus pre-existing, both in the mind of God and a literal pre-existence. I don't believe that means he's co-eternal. Conversely, I think the man Jesus Christ came into being and that he had to be a physical descendant of Jesus. Now, I know you, you would agree with that, but you'd also talk about the incarnation, so you've got a fusion of God and man. You meant physical descendant of David, right? Sorry, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Physical descendant of David. Well, okay. Actually, starting with Abraham, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And the first prophecy That's from Samuel. That's fine, yeah, yeah, And all yeah. that stuff. So, um, for people listening, I mean, it might be super important for you to show you've got that one nailed, um, but, yeah, so that, without... So, so let, me, let me come back on that, because... Yeah. I, I want to explain to you why it is important that you ex that you believe in the Christ of the New Testament. Because if you don't believe in the Christ of the New Testament, you're believing in a false Christ. You're believing in another gospel. And therefore, you have placed yourself outside of salvation by believing in the Christ that you've invented rather than the Christ of Scripture. Now, no, let me finish. I, I allowed you to speak without interruption. And I'm going to ask you to pay me the same courtesy. So when we look at what Scripture says, um, it clearly states, and I think we should just stick in Colossians for a moment, that passage that we discussed last week. So he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Now it says all things were created. So I want to ask you a couple of questions based on that. Logically, logical questions building on scripture, okay. which is, yeah. let, me, let me ask my question. Yeah, yeah sorry. Oh, sorry. So, so my question is, my question is, yeah, you can get up the verse, and you feel free to ask me questions about this passage as well. I want this to be a two-way conversation. But would you agree that time is one of those all things that are created by Jesus? Right, so you think that time is uncreated? No. I think you're misapplying. So you, the first thing that you quoted, just for my context, you quoted 2 Corinthians 11, yeah, 1 to 3, about Paul 
writing to his church saying, I fear that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent, that you would basically follow a counterfeit Jesus. Because if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom I did not preach, you believe him soon enough. That's what I believe you believe, buddy. Now, I grew up in Trinitarian churches my whole life. I've been part of the Trinitarian church, but from a young child, having read the scriptures, it's abundantly clear Jesus and the Father are two distinct separate beings in, in, in all ways, less the authority of the Father placed in the Son. So I'm very happy to talk about that first, but clearly I will answer it from my position. Yeah? Can I reply to that? Yeah. Okay, so you, you haven't answered my question oh, at sorry, all. I didn't. I didn't. Really so, so no, 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 we're not. We're, no, so, we're not doing a time thing. But yeah. I, I want you. I don't want you to jump. Do the Jehovah's Witness trick of jumping from one verse to another. Yeah. I want you to deal with this question. Okay, okay. So the verse that I'd like, and feel free to ask me questions about this same passage. That is fine. But it says in this passage, right, that He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. So He's before all things. And it says that all things have been created through him and for him. Amongst those all things, is time included amongst those all things? That he is before so, okay. and that through him okay. they were created. I disagree. Yeah, so... Uh, I don't know the answer to the question because the author does not does not say what it is. If God, sorry, if Jesus was the first that God created, then after that time, and if Jesus created through Jesus, if Jesus is the literal word, yeah, then from that point on, yeah, time would be created. Mm. But in whatever whatever um, lens you want to look through this, yeah, the Father is dependent on no one. Jesus is dependent on the Father for his existence and everything. So there was a time, you can call it heresy, all that, etc., yeah, what you like, yeah? But the point is, is that without the Father, there is no Jesus, yeah? If, if there was no Jesus, the Father's still there. Now, the way I will address that question is I'm going to go to the beginning of the book of Colossians. I'm going to go to what Paul says, who Paul clearly says is because I believe you're misinterpreting that verse. You're applying it where it's not meant to be applied in a way it's not meant to be. Because essentially, we've got two conflicting narratives in that book. In fact, in every book that Paul writes, and in Colossians, I mean, it's it's absolutely clear. In Colossians and Philippians, two go-to verses, Paul says, the Father is the God of Jesus. So there's no ambiguity, there's no confusion. So if you want to then go to a verse that might imply Jesus was there at the beginning of creation, he created all things, so that includes time, and so therefore Jesus is outside of time, therefore we should go eternal, crack on. I'm not going to do that. I, and I won't, and, and because it's, there's so many hoops you've got to jump through, whereas, if, you know, and then what, whereas Paul, 33 times, he says, the Father is God alone. In seven of those occasions, he specifically says, the risen Jesus, who has ascended and sat at the right hand of the Father, is the God of Jesus. Can I reply? Okay. So, I notice again that you're dodging the obvious logic. You said... No, no, I didn't interrupt you. Don't interrupt me. Otherwise, this starts getting from a nice conversation to a heated one. Um, Because you said that Paul isn't clear. And I'm saying to you, Paul is black and white clear. He literally says all things. Now, one second. All things... What does all things mean in Greek? It means all things. What are all things? It means everything. This is not ambiguous. This is not uh, some vague statement. It's a black and white statement that Christ existed before all things. And that, don't interrupt. Or I'll start interrupting you and then you'll start complaining. Right? So it, it says in scripture that Christ was before all things. That's black and white. Now, the reason why you have to cast aspersions upon Paul and say that Paul writes contradictory narratives is because scriptures like this don't suit the doctrines that you've invented in your own mind because you're not sticking to the scripture. Now, you're quite right in saying that the Father's existence depends upon no one. The Son's existence depends upon the Father. 
Now let's be clear what we mean by this, because we Christians do hold to the monarchical understanding of the Trinity. The, the, the Son receives eternally his essence from the Father. But this is something that happens outside of time, which means that it does not have a beginning. But you should also believe what the scriptures say about the Father, which is that he doesn't change. And if he doesn't change, then he has been eternally the Father. And if he has been eternally the Father, it means the Son has been eternally the Son. Because if you shake your head and say no to that, then what you're saying is the Father has changed. That at some point, he becomes the Father of the Son. And that means that the Father changes. And that's why you're contradicting yourself. Now, it is right, it is right to say, it is right, it is right to say, it is right to say that, 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 that Paul does identify Jesus as the God of Jesus Christ. We Christians believe that. We've got no problem with it. That's totally in sitting with Trinitarian belief. It does not contradict my belief to say that the Father is the God of the Lord Jesus Christ because the Lord Jesus Christ became a man and humbled himself, becoming like a servant. And as that servant, he worshipped the Father as his God. And so the, these statements sit within a Trinitarian view based upon an understanding of the Incarnation. But I'm not going to let you get away from the passage that I want you to deal with. I want you to answer this question. I have answered it. You haven't. You said you didn't know. Because I'm saying to you, I'm saying to you that all things is black and white. It means all things. So is time included amongst all those things that Christ creates? A, I don't know, because that passage is not defined by the author. What do I know? Throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, Jehovah says, I alone created all things. Yeah, there is no God besides me. And you might go to Isaiah, that's happy. The, the point is, yeah, that passage is not clearly defined. What is clearly defined is Paul, who met the risen Jesus Christ, not the incarnate Jesus, yeah, calls Jesus a man, never a God-man, never God the Son, yeah, he calls him a man. We know that Paul was sending into heaven. He tells us in, I think it's Corinthians, how he was taken up to the third heaven. He has seen Jesus not just in vision, but in more ways than we can possibly conceive. Despite this, Paul never, ever attributes in any clear sense that Jesus is superior or equal to the Father. Now, and so I have got to answer that question. I'm going to be honest where I don't know the answer, and then I'm going to give you my understanding, and then you can look to counter that. Yeah, so I'm very happy with that. But the point is, is that the Hebrew Scriptures are clear that God alone created all things. Now, just between you and I, um, in terms of, we've got the passage about in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was God. My take, again, I'm not going to say that I know the answer to this, and, um, is that in the beginning God's Word, He physically spoke and all things came into existence. We know throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, God sent his words to his prophets and they spoke. We know that he did that with Moses, yeah? With the prophet like Moses, God said, look, I'm going to put my word in this person. So, what I would, what I believe is that the word of God that was there at creation, that created all things, was in the man Jesus Christ so powerfully that literally the word of God walked the earth. There is a fusion of not just the word, but Isaiah 11, 1 to 3, about the root of David, the one which the seven spirits of God will rest upon that man, yeah, distinct from the Father. And we even have that in Revelation 22. And, and so you've got this, we, we know we've got a man, we can agree on that. We know that Jehovah says, I'm going to place my word, the word that, was, that I created everything with, I'm going to place in that man. We also know from Isaiah 11 that Jehovah said, I'm going to place the fullness of my spirit, seven spirits of wisdom, of understanding, of courage, of holiness, of godliness, of wisdom, and the fear of Jehovah. Even if Jesus is a God man in his incarnate state, he can't fear himself. Now, and so what I'm saying is that we have that manifest in the man Jesus. Yeah? And I can't understand all that fusion. Now, the doctrine of the Trinity attempts to do that by now declaring that Jesus is in fact God Almighty on earth. The reason why I don't believe that is because Jesus says that's not true, both during his life, after his resurrection, and after his ascension. And he clearly says that he has a God. 
and, and and so that's why that that's what I believe. And you know, um, I, I would never say to someone. I understand why you say to me that my salvation is based on declaring the doctrine of the Trinity. But if you look at the way that Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman, she didn't understand these things. You know. The, the, the old Jewish scribe, um, you know, Paul said, uh, Jesus said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. You know, in none of the letters that actually has been written does Paul address or Peter a confusion over the nature of God. You know, there isn't, there isn't that, that kind of thing. In fact, actually, Paul says, let's move away, or Peter, from the elementary teachings about Jesus. You know, let's not again talk about baptism or laying off hands and all this type of stuff. The problem with the modern church today, every church has got a different opinion on whether we should be baptised, whether the gifts of the Spirit exist for today, um, and all those things. The things that, that Peter or Paul says are the elementary things of, of the anointed one, we as the modern church today, every, everyone's got a different opinion. And that's why I don't think it's a surprise that there is a difference of opinion as to who Jesus is. But, uh, can, I, can I reply yes, to that? Yes. So you, you've stated erroneously that Jesus, uh, Paul never identifies Jesus as God. Um, well, actually he does. He does to Titus. Uh, and in Titus, he says in Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 13, reads, For looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. So there Paul clearly identifies Jesus as God. You also stated erroneously that Peter doesn't identify Jesus as God, but in 2 Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 1, Peter writes this, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith the same of as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So here you have two clear passages where both Paul and Peter identify Jesus Christ as God. And I note that you have, you have obfuscated still on this passage. So going back to Colossians, I'm going to ask you a different question. Because you've run away from the first question, I've asked you three times. You've said that you can't answer the question because it's too vague. So here's my question. When Paul writes in Colossians, all things, what does he mean by all things? So that's a question for you to come back on. Now, I want to be clear. I want to be clear. I have got no problem with the idea that you have rightly stated that the Father... Uh, is the God of Jesus Christ. Got no problem with that. That sits within a Trinitarian worldview. So you've got half of what the Bible teaches, but you haven't got what the scriptures teach in their entirety. Now you've said that God alone creates. So I just want to read to you Isaiah 48. Let's just go to that, if you bear with me. It says, listen to me, O ja I'm just going to ask you to tell me who's speaking here. Yeah. Listen to me, O Jacob, even Israel, whom I called. Yeah. I am he. I am the first. I am also the last. Surely my hand founded the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. Who's speaking there? Jehovah. Yeah. Jehovah, the Father. Yeah. Right, listen. When I called them to stand, they assembled together. Who's speaking there? The Father. The Father. Um, assemble all of you and listen. Who among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. He will carry out his good pleasure on Babylon. His arm will be against the Chaldeans. I, even I have spoken, indeed I have called him. I have brought him and he will make his way successful. Who's speaking there? Still the Father. Still the Father. Come near to me, listen to this. For the first I have not spoken in secret. From the time it took, I, took place, I was there. Who's speaking? Yes, Father. The Father. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Who sent who in that last passage? The Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Who's the me in that passage? Doesn't say. Well, it does say, because look, you've got the me speaking, yeah. the I speaking, and you said it was the Father. So the Father is the one who founded the world and stretched out okay. the heavens, yeah. but he's sent by the Lord God. So let me ask you this question. Who's the Lord God that sent the Father? What? Exactly. No, no, okay. It makes no sense, does it? Uh, uh, 
Let, let, me, let me explain how you should interpret this okay, passage. Okay, okay. Let me explain how you should interpret the passage. Yeah. The one who is speaking is the eternal son. He is the one who founded the earth. He is the one who sent out the heavens. And he is the one who was sent by the Lord God, who is the Father, with the Holy Spirit. Okay. okay. That's how you interpret that okay. passage. In your opinion... So I'll ask you two questions. And, okay, and I'll show you your interpretation is manifestly, with respect, wrong. Great, show from me. Isaiah, show me this passage. Okay. I don't need to show you it from that passage. Look, no doctrine should be established on a handful of verses where the interpretation is difficult. Let's go to Isaiah, the same prophet speaking Isaiah and Nevin. Yeah, the prophecy. Sure you're aware that where Jehovah says, I'm going to raise someone up. Jehovah does not say I'm going to raise up myself. Yeah, I'm going to raise someone up and upon this man I will put my spirit on. Yeah, we go to the book of Revelation. Yeah, read, read, read Isaiah 11, 1 to 3. Yeah, it's really clear. Throughout the book of Revelation, about four or five times, Jesus overtly declares, he is this one who has the seven spirits of Jehovah. See, the book of Revelation, as I'm sure you're aware because you're a bright chap, contains revelation that is previously not contained in Scripture. What is interesting is that in the first verse, John records that the Father gave the revelation to Jesus to give to an angel to give to John. The book of Revelation didn't originate with Jesus. It originated from the Father. And even there, in, the, in, the, um, in, in verse 4, you see a picture of the throne room of heaven. He was, he was, and he was to come. The seven spirits before the throne, yeah? And then it talks about Jesus, yeah? Like the lamb that was slain. And it says, Jesus has raised us up for us to become priests and a kingdom for God his Father. If in the book of Revelation, when Jesus is, is being spoken of in the throne room of heaven and the introduction to the book, we are being told that we, on the testimony of Jesus, are being raised up to be priests for the Father and God of Jesus, we have to listen to those words. The, the seven letters in the book of Revelation were designed to be read out to the congregations, to the churches in Asia Minor. Five times, five times in chapter three, Jesus declares he has a God. So you, you, what, what you're trying to persuade me is that a message that Jesus gave to John to be read out to the churches where he says to them, I have not found your deeds acceptable in the eyes of my God. Yeah, If you are obedient, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. This is being read out to all the churches. I think that's really significant. I don't understand why we then need to go to verses which, and I know you know this because you've studied it, those verses in, that you quoted me from well, 1 or 2 Timothy and 1 Peter, they are beset with some grammatical, interpretational differences, but even if they're not, I could talk to you about the use of the word God, but moreover, what I could say is that, yes, there's one verse where Paul says um, Jesus is God. There are 33 verses where Paul says the Father is God. And, you know, we've got to make a, what's the call? We all have got to make a judgment based on what we think the weighted evidence is leading. Yeah? Okay, let me reply. Yeah. Now, I noticed that you haven't addressed any of my questions, so I'll remind you what my questions are. Okay. My question was, in Colossians chapter 2, when Paul writes all things, yep. what does he mean by all things? That's what I want you to answer that question. Okay. Also, you didn't answer the question from Isaiah 48. 48, what? 48? In Isaiah 48, verses 12 to 16. Okay, listen to you. Are, no, 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 don't okay. interrupt. I didn't interrupt you. I want you, if you're saying that the Father is speaking through all of that passage, I'll just talk to you because he's not listening. If the Father is speaking through all of that passage. Oh, you're filming. If the Father is speaking through all of that passage, who is the Lord God that sends the me with his spirit? Because if it's the Father, then that means that the Father is being sent by a greater God than the Father. But if it's not the Father, then that means it's someone else. But that someone else, that me, is the founder of the earth, the stretcher out of the heavens, the one who is there when all things happened from the beginning. I would like to know who is the one that sent the me in that passage. Now, you didn't answer that, and I'd like you to. Now, 
You're quoted yes. Isaiah 42. You've undone yourself again because you don't know the scripture. Isaiah 42, just to show you that it is the I passage that you've... Yes, you did. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. This is the one that you were referring to. But if you actually read that passage properly, when you get to verse 13, what does it say? It says, Yahweh will go forth like a warrior. So Yahweh is sending Yahweh like a warrior. It literally says Yahweh the right there in the Hebrew, and I will prove you wrong if you dare to dispute it, because I have the Hebrew in my pocket. Now, I want you to address these points, and this is why it's important. Because the God that you believe in, bro, is not the God of Scripture. You've got half the picture of what the Bible says. I wanted to address all your points about Jesus, uh, the Father, being identified as the God of Jesus Christ. I want to address all of that in a very clear statement, and please take it on board, because you keep repeating yourself, and you're not listening to what I'm saying to you. No, I am. I, as a Trinitarian, do not have a problem with the idea that the Father is the God of Jesus Christ. That is completely a Trinitarian belief. We Christians believe that, so no one is disputing it. So just pointing it out again and again and again does not advance the conversation. Because I agree with you, the Father is the God of Jesus Christ. So there is no debate. Jesus Christ humbles himself, becomes a servant, takes on flesh, and worships the Father as his God. And thus, all of those kinds of references are completely applicable. Now, I want you okay. to address okay. these passages. Okay, let's start with the, so, the Colossians, three, yeah? two, two questions. Yeah, yeah. One is, what does Paul mean by all things? Yeah. Second question, who sent the Father according to your interpretation of this passage? And three, why is Yahweh sending Yahweh in Isaiah 42? Okay. So, if you're listening, I apologise. I didn't realise we were filming. I thought there was going to be a camera on top of there. So, I don't know if you've... Have you been able to hear what I've been saying? Yeah, you got a okay. microphone, bro. Oh, um, okay, okay. So, um, the, the first point is this, yeah? I appreciate Trinitarians believe Jesus... Sorry, the Father is God alone and the God of the Father. I do believe repeating that is central to this issue because Jesus said the Father is the only true God. And nowhere else in Scripture does it say anything other than Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, is the only true God. And that's why it's important. Good man Bob wants me to answer the question regarding what is all things in the passage in Colossians. I do not know at present what that means. But what I do know is at the beginning of Colossians, Paul starts the book like this. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Anointed One, when we pray for you. Listen, Paul is not a charlatan, he's not a trickster, he is a teacher of the Gospel. He ascended to heaven, he has seen Jesus sat at the right hand of the Father. Paul only ever clearly, unambiguously and emphatically states that only the Father is God. If Jesus was present at the beginning of creation and Paul is trying to describe his role there, then that is what this passage might be referring to. It may be referring to the new creation, just as Adam was the first seed essentially of the creation there before the fall of man, but Adam got it all wrong, Jesus being the seed of the second creation. So this passage here could be referring to the new creation, and now when Jesus died, he was resurrected into a new, um, a new body, um, new immortal body, there as the one elevated to the right hand and mediator between the soul mediator between the father and humankind a man yeah so we can go back over that verse i don't know i'm going to go now move to the passage in isaiah i just want to um clarify i wasn't uh, quoting from isaiah 44 rather i was quoting from isaiah 11 and i'm just going to read that very quickly because there are some passages in Isaiah where it's, it is a bit difficult to understand who is speaking all the time. Is it Isaiah the prophet speaking 
through the Father or the Father speaking through Isaiah? Is it Isaiah now moving into the first person? We're not always sure. But what is clear is Isaiah 11, 1 to 3. And a shoot will come forth from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from its roots will bear fruit. And the Spirit of Jehovah will rest on him. Him. And a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of understanding, a spirit of counsel, a spirit of might, a spirit of knowledge, a spirit of godliness, and in his breath is the fear of Jehovah. Even in his incarnate state, if we believe Jesus was a God-man, how could he fear himself? He didn't fear himself. Rather, Jesus is the root, is the, is the, is that root of Jesse. And if we move to Revelation chapter 1, we see this. We see Jesus calling himself this prophet who was raised up in Isaiah 11 many times not least at the end of Revelation 22. But in Revelation 1, which let's bear in mind was a revelation that originated with the Father, was given to Jesus. Jesus did not come forth and speak the message to the churches of himself. It came from the Father, Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and it was given to Jesus. Let's just read um, Revelation 1, 4 to 6, John, to the seven churches in Asia, grace and peace to you from the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is coming. So we know that's Jehovah of Exodus 3, 14 to 16. And from the seven spirits that are before his throne, we just heard what those seven spirits are, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead, God never dies in any state, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To the one who loves us, and released us from our sins by his blood, so this is Jesus, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him the Father be glory and power forever and ever. Brothers and sisters, there are some confusing passages in that whole body of scripture, but there are some passages that are clear. I don't know all the answers at this minute, and I'll put some comments afterwards where I talk about Isaiah 44 and 48, but I'll take a break here so Bob can... Okay, so once again he hasn't answered the question. So let me just help him. Let me help educate this brother, because sadly he's just, he's just flip-flopping around the issue. I asked him very straightforwardly, what does all things mean? He couldn't answer that question, so let me answer it for him. By just looking at the Greek, which is all that he needed to do. It is an objective, and it is the word panta, and this is what it means. It means all, the whole, every kind of. It means including all the forms of declension. It's a primary word meaning all, any, every, the whole. Its use is all, any. Um, every, as many as there are, thoroughly whatsoever, whole, whosoever. It, panta means everything, and that means it has to include time. And if it includes time, then Christ is outside of time, and if Christ is outside of time, he is eternal, because time begins with creation. And if Christ was created, then time would begin with his creation. There would be before Christ and after Christ. But there is no before Christ and there is no after Christ because that is a statement of time and Christ created time, as we saw from scriptures. But let's just stick in Colossians because his problems get worse in Colossians. In verse 9, it says, speaking of Christ, this is Paul speaking of Christ. Remember, he said that nowhere does Paul identify Christ as being God. It says, speaking of Christ, reading from verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. This is literally speaking to this brother right now. Philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ. In other words, we build our worldview on Christ, not our own opinions. For in him 
all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Yep. Now, how many deities are there? Two? Three? We as Christians proclaim that there is only one deity. If there is only one deity and the fullness of that deity dwelt in Christ, then it naturally follows that Christ is the one deity. Now, don't simply say you don't know. Don't simply dodge the argument. Address the argument. You don't answer my questions, but see if you can answer this one. Okay. See if you can answer this one. I'm landing soon. This one. How many deities are there? Does Christ possess a different deity to the Father or the same deity as the Father? Now, you've quite rightly pointed out, again, that Jesus Christ is not the same person as the Father. That Jesus Christ does works to the glory of his Father. Totally agree with you. As a Trinitarian, I agree with you. So simply repeating your one argument that you have used for this entire debate and have not managed to engage in any counter-argument does not advance your cause. I have engaged with your argument. I have said to you, I totally agree with you. So therefore, there is nothing to dispute. However, I am challenging you with the black and white words of scripture that says Christ created all things, that according to the scriptures, by your interpretation, there is a greater God that sends the Father, and I've still not heard your answer to that, and that Christ shares the same deity as the Father. Going back to Isaiah, there is a proper interpretation. It's the Trinitarian one. Okay. Jesus Christ is God. He created all things. He was sent by his Father. That's the only accurate okay. interpretation of Scripture. So what Isaiah. Bob has just spoken to you all are the traditions of men. Because nothing that Bob said is actually clearly articulated in Scripture with respect to Bob. And it is a tradition that has been enforced brutally by the sword since about 250 AD, codified in 330 onwards. They are the human traditions of men. Now, why does it say all the fullness of the deity dwelt in Jesus? I've already addressed this point, but to remind you all, we've got to answer this question from the Hebrew Scriptures. If the fullness of deity rests in Jesus, then by definition it means that Jesus is not that deity. It's impossible. It's the basic mechanics of any language, of any race, of any time. The first promise Jehovah gave to the Israelite people and to us all was that he was going to raise up a prophet like Moses. But this prophet would be different to Moses in that unlike Moses, where the father spoke to Moses, Moses then spoke to Aaron and Aaron spoke to the people the word of Jehovah, that Jehovah would himself would place his word in this prophet. And this prophet would speak with the power and authority of God Almighty. Secondly, I've spoken to you about the seven spirits that the prophet Isaiah reveals to us that, the, that Jehovah said, I will raise up one from the root of Jesse, who Jesus time and time again says, I am that person. I'm going to read you from Revelation where he says that. The seven spirits of God Almighty. So, why does Paul say the fullness of deity rests in the anointed one? Because the fullness of the deity rests in the anointed one. That that's what makes, well, that's what makes Jesus. You, you asked if Jesus had the same deity as the Father. No, my question was, how many deities are there? So, how many deities? I believe there is one true God, yeah, that is expressed in the single person, if we say, of Jehovah, the Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because that's what Jehovah says. I also believe that scripture is clear when Father says, I alone created the heavens and the earth. There is ambiguity in this passage in Colossians. Now, Paul, I remind you all, never ever attribute, I don't want to go back over that stuff, I just want to go to, to Revelation, uh, please. Um, when all is said and done, in the book of Revelation 22, is, yeah, Isaiah 22, 16. I, Jesus, sent my angel to testify to you about all these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, 
the bright morning star. Jesus directly is saying, I am that one in Isaiah 11. And he doesn't even just say it there. He also says it in Revelation chapter uh, chapter 3. When he, when he, um, and let's just remind ourselves, this message to the book of Revelation, designed to be read out to the churches, Jesus says, look, I'm the Holy One. I am the true one. I am the one who has the key to David. Jesus is aligning himself with all the passages in Psalms 8, 16, you know, 22, 40, 45, 78, 82, 110. Every passage that talks about the anointed one or the elevated Lord. All these characters in the Hebrew scriptures are distinct from the Father. My last point, because Bob's been very gracious to me, about who is speaking in Isaiah. Bob is saying that there are essentially two Yahwehs. My start point when it comes to interpreting the Hebrew scriptures and aligning what passages we can clearly attribute to Jesus Christ is Luke 24. In Luke 24, Jesus clearly says, there are two points where he revealed to his disciples everything that was written about him in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Not everything in the Hebrew scriptures is about Jesus. There are specific passages that talk about him. And Jesus supernaturally revealed that to his disciples. If we look at what that 40 days of teaching manifests itself, read Acts chapter two and chapter three. We see Peter reveal that teaching. Peter calls Jesus a man. He calls him the Lord, the elevated Lord of Psalm 110, the anointed one of Psalm 2. On that day, when they all professed Jesus as Lord and Messiah, not one person professed Jesus as the second person of a triune Godhead. Can it I reply? would be unthinkable. So, I, I note that he did not answer my questions. Let's be clear, he misspoke the scriptures because he didn't bother to look. So let's just read it again. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So the fullness of the deity is the possession of Christ. And it is there when he is incarnate. So shall we just take a couple of steps this way? Because this guy's just going to start shouting at everybody. Yeah. So, so all the fullness of deity dwelt in Christ. Now, he went on to try and restate that Paul doesn't call Christ God. I remind him what I read in Titus. He literally calls him God in Titus. He tried to suggest that Peter didn't. I, lit I remind him again what Peter wrote in the second epistle. But notice, when these arguments are presented to him, his recourse is to cast aspersions on the scriptures, to say that they're vague, or to say that they've got grammatical mistakes in them, which is what he said. Because when you are filled with your own pride, and you have decided that you know better than 2,000 years of collective study of Christians down through the ages, that you, have arrived at the truth and everyone else through 2,000 years is wrong, then obviously when you're presented with counterfactuals, you have to cast aspersions on the counterfactuals. The fact of the matter is, there is only one deity and Christ possessed it fully and completely. Now, it says in Isaiah, that Yahweh will not share his glory with another. And he nods his head, so he knows that. But deity must always be worshipped. So if Christ is another person, and the fullness of deity is there, then that means that the Bible contradicts itself according to his interpretation, because God says, I will not share my glory with another. There is a way out of this conundrum. There is a way out of this problem. You say that there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So when Christ has the fullness of the deity of the Father and receives the glory of the Father, as he says that he does, there is no contradiction with the Old Testament passages that state, I will not share my glory with another. Now, he didn't answer the question from Isaiah. According to his interpretation, which we have on camera, and JC can do flashbacks if he's in any doubt, when I read this passage to him in Isaiah 48, he said the Father was speaking. 
He said the Father was speaking. But then, if the Father is speaking, who is the Lord God that sends the Father? And if the Lord God is the Father, then who is the me that the Father sends? We Christians don't have a problem with this belief system. Why? Because the Trinity fits with the Scriptures. The Father is sending the Son. The Son created all things. The fullness of deity is in the Son. That deity is the deity of the Father. That means that that Son must be glorified with the Father. And that means that there is no sharing of deity with someone who is not God. So, I want you to uh, address this point. Okay, so the first thing is... It you have is... to ignore the people that haven't taken their medicines yeah, anymore. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I would respectfully disagree with Bob that for 2,000 years the Church has professed the doctrine of the Trinity. I'm not going to go through the history of it, but those of you who are listening would, would see that it is a doctrine that has developed over time. The earliest Jewish followers of Yeshua were known as Nazarenes, and they certainly did not profess in the Triune Godhead. Um, there are one occasion where Paul and one occasion where Peter, in some manuscripts, called Jesus God. Now, you need to decide yourself, 33 occasions where Paul calls the Father God alone, one occasion where he says it's Jesus, and then look at the manuscript variations and the problems with that, you decide which verse you want to trust. The same with Peter. More importantly, do you want to just trust the words of the resurrected Jesus Christ? When, when, when he rose from the dead, the first message he wanted to give to his disciples well, time debate. was, I am ascending to my Father, your Father, my God, your God. The very God in John 17, 13, Jesus said, is the only true God. Now, we don't... Ha uh, Bob talked about the fact that there is a contradiction in that Jesus was... Sh with, with the fullness of the deity resting in Jesus, and therefore Jesus participating of the glory of the one and truly... Uh, the one true God. I would just like to argue that this is a misinterpretation of that verse. We know in Deuteronomy 18 that when, Father, when the Father said to Moses, I'm going to raise up the special prophet whose word I will place in, whose spirit I will lay upon, that Jehovah declared that all men must listen to his words and for those that don't, I will hold him accountable. So, through the Father, Jesus did lots of miracles and miraculous things. Well, Jesus said that we will do greater things than Jesus did. Because the same spirit that was in Jesus will be in us. That does not make us, doesn't mean God is sharing his, his glory in the sense that we should be worshipped as gods. No. The message through the book of Revelation is really clear. Jesus is elevated and worshipped by the angels in Revelation chapter 5, when he is found worthy to break open the scroll at the Father's hand. Throughout the rest of the book of Revelation, it is the Father alone who is worshipped. Jesus shares key titles with the Father because he is the Father's Son. Look, if my son shares some titles with me, it does not make him literally me. Yeah? And let's just go back to the day of Pentecost. When Peter declared Jesus as Lord and Anointed One, is anyone seriously going to argue to that um, anyone there that day, the including Father, Peter, let me, yeah, yeah, thought let's Jesus was yeah. God Almighty yeah, and had been walking on the earth? Very well, thank you. No, no one professed Jesus as God Almighty there. There is another way, and that is the belief of actually Christians, not just in the first, second, third century, in the fifth century. The vandals, non-trinitarians. Just, 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 just going to go through. Yeah. You know, with respect to Bob, the doctrine of the Trinity has been enforced by the sword in the most brutal way. And thank God that these days we can have a cordial discussion. As I'd like to say, brothers who who, who are seeking truth. But you know, in Britain, can, can in the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th up? century, just just really quickly, in France, in Switzerland, in Geneva, I would be burnt at the stake for saying what I say now. Can, can we wrap yeah, it up? But, yeah, that's a really important thing to consider, guys. There hasn't even been freedom for people like me to challenge. C come into line, bro. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, let, 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 I'm, I'm, I just want to sort of, let's do one more wrap-up. Yeah, so you're going to have the last word. Okay? But please don't go on forever because there's other things yes, I want to yeah, do. Of okay, I just want to show again 
to this brother and I hope when you re-watch this video you see how many times you didn't know the scriptures because remember he said that no Jew ever declared Jesus as God well let me read from John chapter 20 where Thomas declares Jesus as God in verse 27 then he said to Thomas reach here your finger and see my hands and reach here your hand and put them into my side and do not be unbelieving but believing Thomas answered and said to him my Lord and my God Jesus said to him because you have seen me my Lord and my God have you believed that he is my Lord and my God blessed are they who did not see and yet believed that Jesus is my Lord and my God so he stated in black and white that no first century Jew declared Jesus Christ as Lord and God and Thomas declared Jesus as Lord and God why would it be valid for Thomas to declare Jesus Lord and God why because the fullness of the deity of the Father was in Jesus Christ God has made it clear that he will not share his glory with another which means that that glory must belong to himself which means that Jesus Christ is that deity Jesus Christ was before all things Amen. and for all things were made for him and he created all things and he was sent by the Father having founded the world and stretched out the heavens and having been there at the beginning of all things now it's clear from scripture and Paul and Peter make it abundantly clear when they say in black and white that Jesus Christ is God they don't say a deity they literally say our Savior and God Jesus Christ how much more plainer can it be I appeal to you bro when you watch this video at home because right now there's too much hubris and pride but have the humility to understand that the God of the Bible is not the one you are worshipping appealing to the crimes of the church in the past is irrelevant to what the Bible teaches it doesn't matter what the church did in the past what matters and that what we're debating is what the scriptures teach and so what I appeal to you when you re-watch this video as I know you will is look at how many times I caught you out on the scriptures you didn't know and how many times you avoided the questions you couldn't answer and accept that you have misunderstood the picture there is a fuller picture of scripture for you to embrace and all I am doing is encouraging you to embrace all of the scripture and here's your last chance because this is your last statement I want you to address oh, Isaiah 48 I, I want you to address Isaiah 48 you said Isaiah 48 it was the father speaking if that's true who is the Lord God that is sending the father according to your interpretation I want to thank Bob for this uh, discussion today last week was the first time we've met it was a bit fiery but hey we all have a bit of energy um, with respect to Bob I'm going to answer the statement about John 20 I'll go away think about Isaiah and I'll put it in the chat the first thing I'd like to say in regards to the statement of Thomas is we need to view his statement through the lens of Judaism in the Second Temple period. The word Elohim, God, was never exclusively associated with Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the first instance. And the reason for this, in the Hebrew Scriptures, the word Elohim can be attributed to angels, to false prophets, to, false, to demons, to Satan, to men. Moses was called a God, the judges of Israel were called a God, and David was also called a God. And the word Elohim was also clearly attributed to Jehovah. But the primary way of, do, of calling out Jehovah was by his name. His name is used 7,000 times in the Bible. The word Elohim is only associated with the one true God if it's linked either to his name directly, or God's name is in the preceding or after or, or following passage by a couple of verses, or the word God is, at, is attached to another honorific title. So that's got to be our start point. The word Elohim never in the Jewish mindset equals the one true God. 
the second. I'm going to go to the testimony of Jesus in John chapter 10. In this, Jesus is accused of being a God or the God. I'm not going to go into which one it was. But in response, Jesus quotes Psalm 82. And it's really important you all go and read it because Jesus says, Jehovah said of men, you are God and scripture cannot be broken. Jesus himself declares that men can be given the title God not the title Jehovah God, but God, yeah, because of the role and function in which they are going to carry out basically God's authority of judgment on the earth. Jesus, the prophet, like Moses, Moses was declared a God over Pharaoh. That's really significant. At the time of Moses, Pharaoh represented the greatest nation on the face of the earth, and he had all the Israelites in subjection. Jehovah declared to Moses, you will be God over Pharaoh. Jehovah declared, you will be God literally over the world, and I will give you authority over this king. So, when, yes. when, Thomas, when Thomas declared to Jesus, my Lord and my God, it's okay, I believe I the, the most reasonable show. explanation based on the whole body of scripture is that Thomas is declaring the title God, as Jesus actually said in John chapter 10, Jesus said, I can claim the title God for myself. But I'm not. I only said I am the son of God. Yeah? I am only the son of God. Can so it's complete, it yeah. But I just want to say thank you again to okay. Bob. It's lovely speaking to yeah. you. Thank you, mate. I hope, I hope that we, we can speak again yeah. and, and, and build on this conversation. But please go back yeah, I will. and go over this conversation I will, I will again. read that Isaiah bit. Please. I'll get into it. Yeah. You know, and I really want passes. an answer. I want to know who's, if that's the Father speaking, then who's the Lord God that sent it? Yeah. I will, I will okay. definitely look at that. Thank and, you very uh, much. Back to you. Right. But, I'm, yeah, ju thank I'm you just going to do a final wrap-up yeah, yeah. and go. Oh, sorry, um, so I just want to, I just want to address his final point. He's going to go away and look at Isaiah 48, and that's great. Yeah, but I just want to address his misstatements about uh, his misstatements about John chapter 20, verse 28, because it's written in Greek, guys. It's not written in Hebrew, so he doesn't know that it says Elohim. It says Theos, but more importantly and more principally, it says Ho Theos. Now, why is the whole theos important? Why? Because when you use whole theos, what you're talking about is the supreme divinity. So he does not know the scriptures as much as he thinks he does. We're done. No, we're done. We're done. No, we're done. We're done. We're done. No, we're done. No, we're done. We're done. No, I've got. I'm going to go on and do other things now. No, I'm going to do that next week. Next week. Next week. Okay, guys. So I'm going to uh, do a, a different talk. Are you wanting to capture this talk? No, I've got an interview with him at 3 o'clock. Okay, you do your interview with him then. But I'm... Are you doing that? I, 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 I'm going to be... Can I speak to him? Yeah. Oh, give him to you. No, 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 you don't need to, because I, I, I want to have a conversation with someone. Are you ready?